right. Hearing Officer Crow, we're on the record when you're ready. Let's call a meeting to order. Uh, please rise and uh, follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Please remain standing. What I'm going to be doing now is placing everybody under oath before they address the hearing officer today. So when I complete reading your oath, please state I do. Please raise your right arm. You and each of you to solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in the matters now pending before this hearing officer will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. You may now be seated. So now I'm going to go through the agenda review and we're going to dismiss cases that are not present this morning. Starting with item number 8, application number 18-10626, Conseco Family LLC, Carlos Conseco, continue to March 24th, 2020, pending receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 9, application number 19-10011, applicant Glenn Kilnick, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 10, Application number 1910218, uh, number 10, 1910058, applicant Chin Hong Chin, continue to March 24th, 2020, pending receipt of original stipulation. Item number 13, application number 1910218, applicant Robert H. and Deborah Bolanus Trust, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 14, application number 1910255, Applicant Robert Busca continued on March 24, 2020, pending receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 15, application number 1910378, applicant Edward McCobb continued on March 24, 2020, pending receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 16, application number 1910387, applicant Jill Ajoika continued on March 24, 2020, pending receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 17, application number 1910452, applicant Wade Kenyon, continue to March 24, 2020, paying receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 18, application number 1910557, applicant Lourdes Yu, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 19, application number 1910596, applicant Brian Berzinski, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 20, application number 1910608, applicant Pan Whittinghofer, removed from the agenda due to the submission of a withdrawal. Item number 21, application number 1910611, applicant uh, Nabil Satchertelli, uh, continued on March 24, 2020, pending receipt of original stipulation. Item number 22, application number 1910662, applicant Ari Chrysler, uh, removed from the agenda due to submission of a withdrawal. Application num item number 23, application number 1910677, applicant Manuel Altabano, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 25, application number 1910704, applicant John Traverson, continued on March 24, 2020, pending receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 26, application number 1910708, applicant Gary Duncan, Denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 28, application number 1910725, applicant Paul Bender, removed from the agenda due to submission of a withdrawal. Item number 29, application number 1910928, applicant Adrian and Elizabeth uh, Jebef, continue March 24, 2020, and please receive an original stipulation. Item number 30, application number 1910958, applicant Cole Grozenowski. Continue on March 24, 2020, in receipt of an original stipulation. Okay. Item number 32, application number 19-10961, uh, applicant J.C. Asaino, uh, denied due to lack of appearance. Okay. Item number 33, application number 19-10966, applicant Allison Martinez, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 34, application number 19-10968, March Shed Choice Trust, postponed to October 20th, 2020, due to extenuating medical circumstances. Item number 36, application number 19-11041, applicant John Adamzak, denied.
denied due to lack of appearance. And item number 37, applicant, or application number 19-11051, applicant uh, Ramathri Sardhar, removed from the agenda due to submission of a withdrawal. That completes the agenda review. Recommended action is to approve. Is anyone uh, here uh, heard their name called? Lacking that, I have most to approve your okay. stipulation. Thank you. Mm. On to public comments. Uh, no one here has is uh, here for an item that is not on the agenda, so we have no one for public comments. Uh, hearing officer Kerr, do you have any hearing officer comments? Uh, the only thing I would. Uh, wonder if uh, all of you have read the little blue pamphlet that's been passed out by the uh, uh, hearing officer, I mean, excuse me, the appeals office. Uh, it kind of gives you the information you're going to need to uh, prove your case and uh, the procedure we go through. Uh, all right, thank you. So that's the remainder items. Um, so let's start with items 11 and 12 for Anderson and Roten LLC. We have Jan Routen here. Yes. yes. And what would you like to do today? Um, I'm looking for a, a property tax reduction due to a fire. And you're prepared to present your case today? Yes. Um, Caleb's got all my. I'm oh not Brenda. You're Brenda. Yes, I'm Brenda. Caleb's got all my stuff. Okay. I think we were looking for a continuance. We just received the information today. Um, I believe you were speaking to Caleb prior to the hearing. Yes. Um, and so since we just got the information today, we would request a continuance to have time to review that data and hopefully resolve the case. Okay. The assessor has that right. So uh, uh, what date uh, would you like to continue to? Uh, well, well, that's a good idea. I mean, can we do it? March, is March 24th okay with you? March well, so you you just gave the assessor the data today. Generally, they need 30 days to review it unless the assessor is willing to do it in less time. So it would be a crunch for the assessor okay. to do okay. March 4th. Okay, then let's do May 19th. That works great. Okay. Okay, assessor has no problem with May 19th. Uh, isn't it Caleb? Does that mean you're going to be hanging on to the pile? Okay. I'll be giving you back the pile after I make copies of it. When? On May 19th? Uh, I think we can get it. I can do that today. Okay. Well, do you have anything else? Anybody else coming? Yeah. You guys can probably help them right now, and we can make sure yeah. copies. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. We want to. I gave this to the applicant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I see you here. I'm the best for you. Okay. 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 The okay. Well, motion has been to move this case to. May 19th, and uh, I approve that. All right, thank you. That motion passes, so you're free to go. Uh, if you would like to stay and watch the rest of the hearing, you can, but it looks like Caleb's going to go help you get your copies back. All right, you guys. Next, we have item 24, application 1910694, Miguel Portillo. Mr. Portillo, um, it's my understanding you want to move forward today. Uh, you're just going to present verbal testimony, is that correct? Correct, because my truck has been installing all my files that were gone, and I don't have any other evidence to prove because all the paperwork it was gone. Mm -hmm. To the assessor? Uh, yeah. The assessor's office has all my information, um, and also um, they have all the meetings when I was uh, doing the construction, during the construction, and they um, miss the date and the um, final when I finish the construction I'm, I'm, I'm trying to um, appeal for you know the assessments Great. It's, so the assessor is prepared to present today it's my understanding that the only issue at hand is the date of completion of the new construction that's the only thing that the applicant has contested do you have any evidence that you can present to? No, everything it was in my file in the truck. It was it was gone. They stole my truck and they destroy everything inside. All the papers they're gone. Uh, yes, I have spoken to the applicant a 
several times advising he should request a continuance and, and prepare some documentation. He does not want to do that, so a continuance will not result in any documentation being provided. So he will only be doing verbal testimony. Well, I'm kind of bound by uh, the evidence that is presented, and if you do not have any evidence, uh, I almost have to rule for the assessor's office. Yeah, they, they, they I, feel, I, would, I speak to them and they told me to still come in the hearing. I would suggest you maybe ask for a continuous and see if you can uh, provide some of that information that uh, has been requested. Well, they should provide it a long time ago when I did the, the uh, application, but they didn't provide anything. Right, the assessor does have documentation to present today um, with regards to the date of completion. Um, there's either a, a misunderstanding or a disagreement on what date of completion should be used. Well, I, that, uh, you still want to go ahead uh, today with, with your case? Well, I don't want it to extend it. I just want to get it done today. Yeah, so I recommend we just come back to this as the first back, hearing, yeah. and, and you'll just have the applicant's verbal testimony. All right, uh, so we'll come back to you shortly to hear your case. Next we have item number 27, application number 1910714, South F Street Revocable Trust, Barbara Grant Trustee, Ms. Grant, yes. are you prepared to move forward this morning? I am. Okay, and you have three copies of your presentation? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. And the assessor's office, are you prepared? Yes, the assessor's office is also prepared to present. Um, we don't anticipate our presentation, which will take more than 80 minutes. Okay. All right. All right, so we'll come back to this in the second hearing. Let me just finish making my notes on it. All right. Item 31, I think, is the next one. Yes, that's what I have. Item 31, application 1910960. Uh, Tim Wynn, and you wanted to uh, reschedule today, correct? Okay, so, okay, can we have it done today? I have everything. You have, uh, it so was, you're... Oh, it was my understanding that the applicant was looking to amend his application to include the value. Right, so if you want to, um, let me cut, hand out copies of your application real quick so we can address this. So this application um, in Section 6 only has penalty marked as far as evaluation challenge. What that means is uh, this appeal as filed is only eligible to address whether or not the 10% penalty should be abated for whether or not the business property statement was timely filed or if he has good cause for being abated. So in order to address the value of the business's assets, the application does need to be amended to check uh, box E1 in section 6, uh, which I believe you, you, you want to go after the value of the business's assets for 2019, correct? Yes. Yes. So that amendment request would have to be approved by your hearing officer, Crow. And then the amendment laws require a 45-day continuance of the hearing unless the assessor waives their right to that time period, so we would have to be rescheduling out to at least May 19th, uh, unless the parties waive the, the noticing period. So um, let's just first start with the approval of the amendment. Hearing Officer Crow, do you approve the request to amend the application in Section 6 to add the selection of Box E1? Basically, he's just uh, appealing the penalty assessment of the debt Well, right, so the amendment request before you right now is to allow him to also appeal the business property fixtures and the assets of the business. So okay. uh, by, if you approve the amendment request, um, then he'd be permitted uh, at a future hearing to present evidence on the value of the business assets. So approved. All right, so that's been approved. Now, as far as the hearing goes, 
since the assessor just was made aware of this amendment today, I'm sure you're not prepared to move forward today. We are not prepared to move forward, um, and we haven't received any data with regards to the penalty or the valuation, um, so we'll need um, to get some data from the applicant, um, and I would suggest May 19th as the earliest date, since we haven't yet had that exchange. Okay, so Mr. Wynn, the assessor's office has indicated they can't go forward today. Are you okay with rescheduling the May 19th? Yeah. That works for you, all right. On the data that the assessor's requesting, do you have a time period of when you would like that? Would it be possible to get the data within the next two weeks? Uh, so I need to get with the assessor. If I may speak, so Mr. Wayne has brought me some information. Uh, I haven't analyzed it yet, so I, I'd have to get back to him maybe this week. So we may need additional data or not. Sure That's that. correct. I don't have, uh, I believe some of the assets were repossessed. Is that everyone understanding? Yes. So mm -hmm. the applicant may have the information in his packet that he's given to me. Uh, I don't have an answer right now. I'm on the spot, so. Uh, I'd have to get back to you now. Um, so maybe we could request that any additional data be provided within the next, say, three weeks. Okay. That'll be added to the motion. Yes. All right. Okay. So the current motion is to continue to May 19th, 2020, with the proviso that the applicant will provide the assessor with any additional data within the next three weeks after it's been requested. Approved? So approved. All right, thank you. So you're all set. Uh, just work with Todd between now and May 19th, and if you have to come back, we'll see you on May 19th. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, that takes us to item 35, application of 19-11037, applicant is Laura Clifford. Ms. Clifford, are you prepared to move forward today? Yes. All right, and you have three copies of your presentation? Yes. Right, to the assessor? Um, the assessor is also prepared to move forward. All right, so we'll come back to this as the third hearing. And last is item number 38, application number 19-11052, applicant Matthew Newman. And Mr. Newman, at this time you're requesting an extension, is that correct? Yes. All right, you have a preference of the dates? We'll go May 19th. All right, any issue with that on the assessor then? Yep, that works for us. And you want the data within a certain amount of time? Do you still need data? Yes. Um, whatever documents you can find, um, we'll say, what do you mean? Three, three weeks. Yeah. Or, yeah. Just to be consistent with the last Yep. <laughs> so three weeks, so three weeks to send it to you or bring them? No, just to send it to me. Okay. Well, do you think you need more than three weeks? No, I know you said no, I'm going to get on it. But uh, there's an email. Yeah, I'll okay. get it. Get you. It's a motion to, to uh, It's to continue to May 19th with the proviso that requested data be provided to the assessor within the next three weeks. So moved. All right, thank you. So that completes our agenda run through. So let's just get started with our first case. Uh, Mr. Portillo, if you'd like to just wheel your chair up to the desk here and get comfortable. So make yourself comfortable. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna have you out. Should have. Find your application. I thought I printed it out. Uh, this might be the only one I did not print out. <laughs> So 
as the assessor previously indicated, this is an appeal of new construction um, for a residential property. And is it correct, sir, you're only challenging that the construction did not occur on December 1st, 2017. It occurred on some other date. Is that yeah, it was on the, uh, on the 18th, December 18th. Okay, so your, your position is construction wasn't completed until 2018. Yeah, it was. Okay. Uh, it was down to 85 percent. Okay. We don't we don't need full detail. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with that. Okay. Um, Assessor, do you have a clarification on who has the burden of proof in this? I was just trying to figure that out. Um, it's owner occupied. I think does it have to do if they filed a construction statement or not? Is that what changes it? I can't remember. I, well, they don't have a homeowner's exemption. Oh. Well, because it was a new oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Sir, you marked that you lived in the property after you completed this. Did you move into it as your primary residence? Uh, no. No, so you don't live there? No, I don't live so you there. You haven't ever lived there. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. On the application, you had marked right here on page one in section three that you were occupying it as your primary residence. So, no, which is just fine. We've clarified that now. Sometimes that gets... Like, like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it would advocate and want to have the burden of proof. Okay. So what's going to happen, sir, is first you're going to present whatever you want, and then the assessor will have the opportunity to ask you questions, and then the assessor will present their case. So if you want to just go ahead, I know you only have verbal testimony, so the hearing officer is who's making the decision, so go ahead and make your case to him whenever you're ready. Well, the, the, the thing is, it was only the completion uh, date as well, I'm, uh, and also I'm trying to avoid the um, assessments. That's all I'm fighting for, nothing else. It was like a, over a $500 difference. Now, this is new construction. Do you, uh, you had building permits, I assume? Yes. And were they signed off by the uh, city of Ventura? Yeah, they did. The... Uh, the way they work is like uh, if they sign you up, if, if the completion sometimes is not done completely, they can sign you up. And that's what happened. They signed me up before I, I did my driveways, besides I did my um, uh, sidewalks. And they signed me up. They said, no, they're ready, we, we're done. And they signed me up right before. So the improvement was actually finished as far as the, the structure itself, the, the home? Yeah, inside, there were details they, they need to be done, but they said, yo, you need this, you need that, like a painting, and they, they, they still sign me off. Yeah, is that true? In your statement? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes, that's true. go through a brief history of what we did and why we based our completion date on what we based it on. Um, so permit number C13-877 was issued for construction of a new single family residence on February 25th, 2014. On January 4th, 2018, the owner called the assessor's office and informed our evaluation division that the construction was completed as of December 31st, 2017. Uh, based on this information, uh, our, the assessor's office completed the construction as of the reported date of December 30th, 2017. Um, upon review, uh, it was discovered that the Ventura County Building and Safety had finalized the construction as of February 5th, 2017. Uh, so about 10 months prior to December 30th, 2017. Um, the assessor decided to give the owner the benefit of the doubt and they kept the completion date of December 30th, 2017 uh, based on the information that they had available at the time. Um, so the applicant filed the appeal on the basis that the project was not complete as of December 30th, 2017. 
uh, but was actually 85% complete as of January 1st, 2018. Uh, I had requested some documentation to show um, why he felt the completion date should be changed, um, but he said due to theft, he you know, had the documentation. So, um, so when I reviewed the case based on the information I had uh, with the building and safety finalizing the construction on um, February 5th, 2017, and then the call to our office stating that the project was complete as of December 30th, 2017, uh, I decided that the completion date should remain the same. Um, and that's why I recommend to you today that the completion date remain the same, December 30th, 2017. Um, and if you turn to page two, or two and three, I have a uh, property tax rule 463, and it, I, on page three, I highlighted section E there that talks about the dates of completion. Uh, very quickly, it just says, uh, the date of completion is the date the property or portion thereof is available for use. In determining whether the real property or a portion thereof is available for use, consideration shall be given to the date of the final inspection by the appropriate government, governmental official. Or the, in the absence of such inspection, the date the prime contractor fulfilled all his contract obligations, or in the case of fixtures, the date the completion of testing machinery and equipment. So, uh, this rule basically states if um, the appropriate government official, such as building and safety, has signed off on a final inspection, then that is uh, that is the date we should use. Um, so, and then here on page four, I just have a quick a little printout of when building and safety did the final inspection. Um, and you can see there, it says final building at the top. February 5th, 2017. And then uh, I also included a couple of our pictures that were in our building record. One was dated March 1st, 2017, which was shortly after building and safety had signed off on it. And then the page six, I have a date of March 18th, 2018. Um, yeah, so uh, that completes my presentation. Do you have any questions of the assessor? No. Uh, do you have any concluding remarks? No. I mean, everything, it looks like um, you guys have the last call, last decision, and that's about it. Okay, well, I'll take your uh, case under submission now, and Mr. Prakakis will let you know uh, my decision. Okay. Thank you. So if you want to reach out to me in a few days, I should have this decision, and, and maybe in a week or two I'll have it written up and sent to you. I'm a little bit behind on mailing out written decisions, but you, you can call me and I should be able to give it to you. And you're, uh, so you're free to go, or if you want to stay and watch the other hearings, you can stay. So next up we're going to have Ms. Grant, if you want to come take a seat at the table. So this is a challenge of the purchase assessment for Jan uh, July 19th, 2018, and the assessor accepted the purchase price, correct? That's correct. So, Ms. Grant, you'll have the burden of proof, uh, so the, uh, you'll present your case first, just like the last applicant. Okay. Then the assessor will have the opportunity to ask you questions, right. uh, and then the assessor will present their case. Uh, so, this is just a residential property in Oxnard. Before she get into her case, Mr. Officer Crow, did you want any other information from the assessor? Yes, I'd like to know a little a little about the property. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the property is 225 South F Street, located in Oxnard. Um, as you stated, this is a base year value appeal for the July 19th, 2018 transfer. 
and also a decline in value appeal as of January 1st, 2019. Um, <clears throat> the applicant purchased the property for $712,500 uh, and the assessor accepted the sales price under the provisions of Rule 2. Um, and I believe that's... This is a single family? Uh, yes, it is a single family. Uh, what's the size of it? The square footage of it is... 2647. Yes, 2647. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. One thing I want to make sure, to, uh, I think I spoke to Ms. Grant about this before when she came into our office. Because the assessor accepted her purchase price, she does have to prove by a margin of 5% or more that her property was overvalued. So there is that threshold when the assessor accepts the purchase price. I, and we discussed that. We previously. did. Okay. Thank so you. I just wanted to make sure and put that out there. So if you'd like to submit your three copies. Okay. Um, now, can I start with, if you, don't, if you just want to do them one at a time, that's yeah, fine. Can I start with, um, here's um, the subject property. Okay. This Is this a copy for uh, you? Yes, thank All right. you. And then if we can start with decline in value. If you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then, um, do you want these now? Yeah, it'd be easier okay. just to hand them all out now. We'll get them um, all in order. Okay, and you can talk about them when you want. That's for base value. Or you can leave them quick if you want. So, oh, one, oh yeah, each is one packet. Right, Got so it. that way. One packet here. One packet there. there. One packet there. And is that everything? It is. All right, so go ahead and give the hearing officer an overview whenever you're ready. Okay, so I purchased the property for uh, 712500 um, and I believe that the, um, well, first I've included the um, subject property um, printout of the MLS details, so we could probably use that for both the decline in value and the base value. Um, I have a decline in value um, comp comparison. And it has the subject property and then um, one comp. Uh, it, it says comp two, but that should be comp one. Um, the comp is 201 South G Street. It's approximately, well, it's exactly 582 feet from my house. Um, and it was sold for 625 uh, within a few months of mine. The sales date was. Um, on that one is 12-18-2018, so roughly, you know, four months after mine. Um, I believe, and the attached to the decline in value market evaluation is that comp on G Street. So if you wanted to look at any details of it, um, it's extremely similar to mine in the following ways. It's a two-story, it's a craftsman. Um, it's almost behind my house. It's in the Henry T. Oxnard Historical District. So um, I believe it's a good comp for this. It was built in 1923, uh, mine in 1912. Uh, the lots are almost identical, minus 0.33 of an acre, and the G Street comp is 0.32 of an acre. Um, so I've um, put a net adjustment at the bottom here um, of 31000 negative for the G Street home um, because that house is on a corner lot and it has excessive traffic. It's on the um, G Street and 2nd Street. So there's substantial noise and traffic there. And then I deducted um, $1,000 because that's a two-car garage, and mine is a one. And so I've noted under subject property, it says under garage area, not three. For some reason, the assessor's office has it listed as a three-car garage. Mine is a one-car garage with a separate workshop on one area, which has a little separate door that does not connect to the garage. And then on the other side of the one-car garage is a little storage room. It doesn't have a car entry. It doesn't have a um, garage door. And each of these three 
little um, items. The middle um, item being the one car garage has a rolling carriage house sliding door and I have pictures here um, if you want to um, refer to them. Um, let's see. The end of the day, Sky. So I just need a moment. I just I can't remember where the pictures are. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. The pictures are on under this page of the subject property. The garage pictures are on the reverse. And you can see that there's a door on the left which has X's on it. That's a one car rolling carriage house door. Now, there's a wall between this storage room. This is a storage room. There's a wall here. There's the one car garage, and this simply slides this way. On this side, there's another little door that matches this. It's similar, it's paneled, and it goes into a tiny, tiny, like little workshop area. There's nothing in there. It also is separated by an interior wall. These were all built separately. So although um, the assessors noted it as three, it's actually one. I also have pictures of it here showing my car, and you can see it takes up the whole place. We need reference of that. So for my property, I've deducted $5,000 for that. Um, then um, there's something about the property uh, to which I was unaware prior to purchasing it, that it is adjacent to a drug rehab facility at the home next door, and that's at 205 South F Street. Um, I have brought, if you would like, the owner's phone number, um, the owner's representative's phone number, and also the rehab manager there. I'm happy to provide those if you need those, ask me for those. But this rehab is an absolute nightmare. They're smoking within feet of my north property line. They're having uh, outdoor meetings right along the property line. The chairs are lined up right along the property line. And our properties have a north property line boundary. And my house is very, very close to that line. Their house is more towards 2nd Street. It, it, it's quite a ways away. So they're using the backyard adjacent on their side of the lot line to have these meetings, to have the smoking access. Um, and smoke is coming into my house. There's noise. Um, there's excessive turnover of residents at this rehab. I'm sure some folks get, get well and then they go out to the world. But it's affecting me. There's excessive traffic from cars from pedestrians, from pedestrian visitors, also from the residents. Um, they have outdoor meetings. Some of the residents have dogs with them. So at a certain time, there are multiple dogs living at the property. And of course, they're all barking. Um, anyway, those are nuisances that I was unaware of when I purchased the home. Um, I, there was no way I could do my due diligence on that because it's a private facility, meaning it's not listed with the state of California. So it doesn't have to abide by certain rules. But it is a nuisance. I've asked for the smoking to stop. They ignore me. I've asked for you know corrections on some of these things. They just ignore me. So I have adjusted the price on my property um, in the following ways. 5000 for the garage discrepancy and 65000 for the um, lot attributes, the traffic, the nuisances from just the rehab, 65000 respectively. So therefore, my total net adjustment on the, my property is 70000 with an adjusted sale price of um, 642500 So therefore, I believe that just based on this, that I've met the burden of proof that I need to show that my property um, has to be um, valued 5,000, I'm sorry, 5% or less. Correct, Brendan? Is that, yes. is that the correct way to word that? The, the, there has to be, a, uh, the value has to be 5%.
Okay. So this value, um, you know, is clearly in excess of five percent. It's more like seven percent. Six and a half. I think it's six and a half. Uh, so that takes care of the base value, and then the next. Um, I'm sorry, the decline in value. The next one I have is the base value. Um, there, I've submitted three comps for these, and I know there might be um, some issue with my house is zoned R2, the three comps are zoned R3. However, they're the same type of house. They're um, very close. One is about mm, 580 feet from my home. The other one is point three and comp number three is point five. I've used these because they're most similar to mine. They're craftsmen. Um, three out of four of these are single story. They're all built on or about the same time. Comp one is um, 1912, comp two is 1915, and comp three, 1905. So they're all the same type. They have roughly the same square footage with the exception of Comp 1. Um, comp 2 is at 545 West 5th Street. I put this one in, and if you wouldn't mind looking at um, the, the sheet on the last pages, there are pictures of the interior, which are almost mm, identical to mine interior-wise. So that's why I've included this, and I have made a zoning adjustment, um, monetary. If you look at the picture here on the bottom right, you'll see it's all hardwood paneling. There's proper uh, ceilings, all hardwood floors, plate rails, picture rails. And then if you move on to the second page, there's a large stone fireplace, which mine has as well. The picture below that also shows the fireplace with the um, craftsman style dividers here of wood. And you can see the built-ins, um, the windows, the beamed coffered ceilings. These are all almost identical to my home. And on the third page, um, more of the same. The, there's built-in pantry, I mean built-in in the dining room, built-in uh, in this room here. And then on my property, if you go to the last page of the subject property, you can see, I'm sorry, the second page, you can see that my home is almost identical in the interior. It's the same separators of the three-quarter high partition craftsman wall, the hardwood floors, the um, wood boxed carpet ceiling, the built ins, the three quarter height of paneled walls with the plate rails, the chair rails. Um, I have a stone fireplace as well that's similar to that. Um, so I believe based on that and also uh, that makes it a good comp because of the interior is almost the same. So um, that's how I've um, come up with my values. And so for the base year, um, again, I valued it, adjusted sales price at 642500 based on the um, substantial uh, issue and rehab. So I've taken that into, correct, into um, consideration. Do you have any questions? Assessor, do you have questions? Um, yes. Uh, you mentioned a discrepancy in the, the garage. garage. Here's a picture of the garage, a large picture. Mm -hmm. And here's the one car garage with the rolling door. Right. Um, did you allow the assessor access to your home to verify their building record? Uh, they did not ask to come verify the garage. If they would like to come verify the garage, I'm happy to set up an appointment. But they did not ask to come verify the garage. In fact, I just discovered, and this is the reason, I just discovered this mistake when I was preparing these documents. So that's another reason why 
um, that just came to light mm -hmm. n now. Okay. So I understand that's your testimony that we should only value a one car garage, correct? Well, because well, there's only one place you can put the car. Do you disagree with the square footage we have for that building? Did you uh, provide any documentation that it's a different square footage, or is it just that it's you can only park one car? I can only park. I. This building here is separated into three sections. There's a wall interior-wise here and here. There's a storage room. There's one car garage and then a, an empty little workshop. So I haven't measured the interior of the garage. My one car fits in there. If they want to come and measure it, they can. All I know is I noticed that there were three cars and I have one car. It's not that big of a deal, I mean, compared to the rehab. I was just pointing it out. I noticed they have 532 square feet for the garage. I'm, I'm sure it's not that, but I think the rehab is what substantially uh, affects my property in a negative way at, at a minimum of 6.5% um, from what I paid. And you bought it through a broker? I did, yes. The broker didn't measure the garage, though. The broker was given this um, with the same details that you have, although this says a two-car garage on here. You go to, um, let's say, garage. If you go to the bottom, it says garage capacity two. So you see there's a discrepancy there as well. Um, but at that notwithstanding, at the point of purchase, I didn't know what the assessor records were. Again, I just discovered this literally a couple of days ago, the difference between the three car and the two car. So I would have no way to know that prior to purchase. Okay. Um, did the assessor ask for a site inspection now? The assessor, the, I'm sorry, the assessor um, asked for a site inspection and it was unable to accommodate because I'm only um, able to take off so many days a year and I also had a stroke and I've used some of those days and then I had taken off this day and I can do it on a weekend, um, I can do it on a Saturday and a Sunday which is fine. So if they want to accommodate that they can but I've used whatever small amount of time I have for t time off already. I did nicely explain this to the assessor numerous times that I was unable, due to my employment, to honor uh, the site inspection at this time. Unless they want to come on a weekend, that's fine. Okay. Um. And I'm assuming they're just coming to look at the garage, right? Because I could leave that open and they could just wander on and they is that well, acceptable uh, to you? Our intention would be to verify the entire building record as well as Right, but you condition. don't need to do that. The only issue is with the garage. So I, I'm trying to facilitate this. Like I could leave the garage open. The only discrepancy we have in building records is for the garage. I can leave the gate, driveway gate and the garage open, mm -hmm. all three areas. He could go in and measure. He could go in and have at it while I'm not on the property. And you also mentioned the condition of the property as well. The condition is as I bought it, as it was in 1912, with the exception of many, many years ago, I think in the 30s or something, 40s, they had done over a bathroom. The home, interior-wise, and the garage is as it was, you know, 100 years ago. The house is as it was then. Okay. There, there have been, I have done no improvements, I've done nothing, um, so. Okay. Does that conclude your It family? does, yes. Yeah. So the assessor. Um, Thank you.
So I'll be starting on page one of my presentation. I'm just going to read through some of the history and um, so the Citric property was purchased on July 19, 2018 for seven five hundred. Uh, this value was enrolled as fair market value and established the base value for the property pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 110.1b. Uh, pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 51a, the assessor is required to enroll the lesser of the factored base year value or its full cash value as of the lien date. The value of $712,500 was enrolled for January 1st, 2019 as the factored base year value and the full cash value. Um, pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 110, the purchase price is presumed to be the full cash value of the property unless there is a preponderance of evidence that the property will not have sold for that purchase price in an open market transaction. It is rebuttably presumed that the purchase price is fair market value if the terms of the transaction were negotiated at arm's length between a knowledgeable buyer and seller, neither of which could take advantage of the exigencies of the other. The property was listed on the open market and the purchaser was represented by a professional realtor. Uh, the assessor presumed that the sales price was negotiated at arm's length and the sales price is the full cash value. Um, this value was enrolled as the base year value pursuant to RT code section 75.10. Um, pursuant to property tax rule 2B, uh, the presumption shall shift the burden of proving value by a preponderance of evidence to the party seeking to overcome the presumption. The presumption may be rebutted by evidence that the full cash value of the property is significantly more or less than the total cash equivalent uh, of the consideration for the property. A significant deviation means a deviation of more than 5% of the total consideration. Um, so the assessor requested the transfer documents uh, associated with the acquisition of property uh, the appraisal, inspection report, close of escrow statements, etc. Uh, but uh, the applicant told me that she no longer had access to them and could not provide them. Uh, I also requested a site inspection of the subject uh, in order to determine the comparability of the available sales as well as uh, verify our building record and the condition of the property. Uh, but we were denied due to the applicant's availability. Um, Therefore, the assessor relied on our building record and the internet list listings in order to value the property. Um, the subject is located in the historic district of, uh, to the east of downtown Oxnard. Uh, the subject is considered a historic structure and qualified for the Mills Act in May of 2019. Uh, the appraisals prepared for this appeal rely on sales of historic structures located in the same historic district as the subject property. And then I just wanted to go into a little bit of detail about the Mills Act. Uh, the Mills Act is a state law allowing cities to enter into contracts with the owners of historic structures. Uh, such contracts require a reduction of property taxes in exchange for the continued preservation of the property. Uh, the subject entered into the Mills Act in May 2019. The restriction will begin in the 2020-2021 roll year and not the 2019-2020 roll year since the property was unrestricted as of January 1st, 2019. Um, so moving on to page three of the presentation. This is my appraisal for the base year value uh, as of July 19th, 2018. I have uh, three sales here. Like I said, they're all in the same historic district in Oxnard. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom, they're all very close to my subject. Uh, 0 0.1 miles, 0 0.1 miles, and 0.2 miles. Um, and you know, I did typical adjustments for the differences um, based on what I could see of the internet listings. The subject appeared to be in average condition when I compared it to the other properties. Uh, the, the pictures were very limited. Um, I'm not sure. 
can only really base it on two pictures which I have I have provided in our um, uh, presentation and we'll go to that shortly. Um, so I did consider it average for the neighborhood. Um, and like I said, I made some typical adjustments. Uh, the one adjustment I do want to point out is on comp number one here. I did consider its location to be a bit superior to the subject uh, because it was directly next to um, a parking lot instead of a neighbor. So in my opinion, uh, this parking lot serves a church. So you know, Monday, most days, the parking lot is usually empty. When I drove through it and did my site inspect, my drive-by site inspections, um, it was completely empty. So in my opinion, I did think that that uh, might have more desirability in the market, not having a neighbor directly next to you. Um, so I did make a negative adjustment there for that difference. Other than that, uh, the rest of my adjustments are pretty typical. Um, and I have a range of value here. Um, my lowest was 670000 My highest was 705000 And the sales price of the subject fell within 5% of the higher end of my range. Um, so uh, under the provisions of Rule 2 and the RMT code, I did feel that it fell within uh, the parameters for being a Rule 2 sale. Uh, and therefore, the sales price of $712,500, I believe, is the fair market value for the property. Uh, so that's my appraisal for the base year. Can I make a comment on your appraisal, uh, on your comps? I believe you're the Okay, I didn't, I didn't you can ask questions. All right, so, um, and then the next page. Uh, for some reason, I don't have a page number, but it'd be page five here. This is my <coughs> January 1st, 2019 valuation to determine if a reduction in value would be necessary. Okay. Um, yeah, it doesn't have a page number on it, but it is page five here. Yeah, that one, yeah. Um, so, comp number one is the sale of the subject on. July 19, 2018, I felt it was the best comparable. Uh, and then I have two comparables to support that. Uh, my second one is also one that the applicant used, 201 South G Street. Uh, and then finally, 320 South F Street, which is also nearby, it's 0.1 miles away. Uh, that one was also used in the base, base year value um, uh, appraisal, and that's also the one that received the reduction for being next to a parking lot. Uh, so, uh, based on this appraisal, I got a range of 618,000 as the low, 712,500, which was the sale of the subject. Uh, I felt that, that the subject was the best comparable, it fell right within the range. Um, so, I did not see a reduction for January 1st, 2019. So I kept the base year value of 712500 which is also the sales price of the subject for June 1st, 2019. Uh, turning to page six, these are my maps for the two appraisals. The top one is the base year. Uh, the bottom one is the uh, first one. You notice they're all very close. Uh, and then I have this, the pictures of the subject. Um, these are from the listing. So this is what I had to base my um, appraisal off of. I was looking at the, the wood floors, the <coughs> wood trim and everything on the walls, the coffered ceilings. Um, and there were a couple other pictures, but they were about the same as these. Um, and you know, to me, it looked fairly average for the neighborhood. Turning to page eight, through, uh, eight through 11, you'll see pictures of the comparables. Um, and you can look through those. I felt that they were pretty similar. And then page 
13, I just have uh, some listing information here for the subject property. And that is um, also for my packet. So I'll swing conclusion. And go back to my conclusion again. Uh, the property was listed on the open market, and the applicant was represented by a professional realtor. The assessor enrolled the negotiated purchase price as the base value for the property. Uh, the sale of the subject is considered the greatest indicator of value for January 1st, 2019. The assessor believes the number of proof has been met and requests the board sustain the enrolled value for January 19, 2018 purchase date and the January 1st, 2019 loan date. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Okay. Do you have any questions of the assessor? Yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned the property, your comp one, 320 South F Street, and that property has a similar issue as mine. This is adjacent, as you mentioned, on their north property line by the Catholic Church, which has um, a large parking lot, which is within feet of this house, um, and that is full on and off five or six days a week. There's substantial um, parking in there. It's normally filled and there's traffic with people, the newspaper vendors there. Um, I'm bringing this up because my home has a substantial issue with the rehab factor. And although I purchased my home with a professional realtor, that notwithstanding, um, I was unable, and the realtor would have been unable, to know there was a rehab there. There's no sign. You wouldn't know unless you went around the neighborhood and knocked on every door and said, you know, who lives here, are you a rehab? You just wouldn't know that it's there. So I was not able to know that um, prior to purchasing the house. I, I understand that you've accepted the purchase price. Um, your, the last thing is that um, your photos prove my point that the home, my home, is in the same condition it was in 1912. Um, I mean, there it is. The, that that's how the interior looks. So um, I believe that interior is um, most equal to the house at 545 Fifth Street. I don't believe my interior is similar to 320 F Street. And you also mentioned the Mills Act, and I guess my last point would be the Mills Act is is, is not um, is not part of the it's not relevant to the meeting. Um, the Mills Act, of course, as you mentioned, is a contract with the city under which I make a list every ten years of um, things I'm going to do to the house. Let's say hypothetically, I'm going to rewire old knob and tube, if a house had it. These aren't examples of my home, but I'm just saying there are substantial costs um, to the Mills Act for me and any other person. For example, my home needs a new kitchen. And I mean, that alone would be you know, $70,000 to do it historically back to what it was when it was built. All of these homes have, you know, warped floors, crumbling foundations, um, things like some of them have in rooms no electricity, such as there are rooms in my home with no electricity. Others have one outlet. All of these things to be repaired are hundreds of thousands of dollars. My home doesn't have any heat upstairs. It only has heat, floor furnace heat downstairs. These are just examples. So when you bring up the Mills Act, although it has a reduction in property taxes, it isn't relative to this meeting because it's costing me 10 times more in um, repairs to meet my contract with the Mills Act than I'm receiving as a discounted taxes. Does that make sense? So you're saying that uh, uh, the Mills Act, to be a member, you're required to make these repairs? Yes, sir. I'm required. You're, re you're requested to apply. I recently re applied for the Mills Act. And it's a contract, for example, between myself and the city. I agree to make every 10 years I have to submit a list 
of 10 things I'm going to do. I have to meet before the historic board. I have to show them what the costs of each of these 10 items are. And then that is entered as part of the contract. And it's recorded here downstairs in your office. So, for example, the, the repairs that I'm going to be doing over the next 10 years, I mean, are hundreds of thousands of dollars. Anytime you repair an historical property, you need to repair it back to or in the manner it originally was. And tradesmen aren't available nowadays to do these kind of repairs. So if you can find someone, they're very, very costly. And the houses are so far deteriorated just because they were built, you know, 120 years ago. So everything's warped, the foundations are crumbling. And that's the reason the city wants to preserve these houses. So as an incentive for me to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and keep the property as shown in the pictures, just like it was 112 years ago, they give you a slight reduction in taxes. But it's offset by what I'll be spending. Can I ask two clarification questions first to the assessor? You were just saying that these appeals are not affected by the Mills Act because it's going to apply to next year, correct? That correct, and I was just giving a history of the property. And Ms. Grant, were you required as a condition of buying this property to apply for the Mills Act after you purchased it? Or I, could you have bought it and not applied for it? Okay, well then, when I purchased the property, it was not under the Mills Act. Okay. I'm a historical buck. I did the application myself to save the property, so it would be given okay. 200 so years. So there wasn't, there wasn't a condition you have to apply for the Mills Act if you buy the property. You could have not applied for it and not received the right. tax Right, and I could have you know, remodeled it and it would have been destroyed. So. Um, I did have a question about the, you said you mentioned the condition of the kitchen and the, and the heat upstairs. Do you have any um, pictures? that you presented today that show the kitchen? Um, I didn't bring kitchen photos. I'll be happy to email you kitchen photos if that's acceptable. Had I known we needed those, of course, I, I'm very prepared. I would have brought those. I'll be happy to bring you the kitchen. The kitchen is a disaster. But you did see the property before the kitchen. I did. But I think I understand that you're saying I saw it, I knew what it was like. That notwithstanding, yes, I saw it, and yes, I paid seven, twelve, five hundred. We can at least agree there, right? Yeah, My right. issue is there should be a reduction of six and a half, seven percent because of the rehab next door, which is really an excessive nuisance. And you're allowing the property at three twenty South F Street a sixty-eight thousand credit for the church parking lot within feet of their home. I'm just asking for same, and that's why I put down, uh, I think it was 65000 for my nuisance on my property line. Okay, so... Right, okay, so it, for appraisals, you actually, you make adjustments to the comps you, and make it like the subject. You don't make adjustments to the subject. I'm aware of that. Yeah. I, I, I get that, but I, what I'm trying to point out is even though that's the way to do it, I've done it that way here. However, I was trying to prove up on my subject property and my evaluations the 5% that I have to show difference between what I pay and what I think the property is worth. That's why I put in the um, nuisance to my property and what I thought that nuisance should be valued at based upon the assessor's uh, paperwork was submitted to me showing that 320 South F Street had um, a negative 68,000. So therefore, I valued my nuisance at 65. They're both on the north north lot line. They both take up the whole property, backyard, front yard, everything. They, these nuisances run vertically on the north pro property line of each of these properties. So the nuisances are fairly similar. Okay, so. Um so for comp number one, are you saying I should remove the $68,000 adjustment in order to make it more comparable to your subject? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm, what I'm saying is um, I noted 65000 on my um, base 
and on my um, decline in value mm -hmm. appraisals because this nuisance at 320 South F Street, you, you've deducted 68000 I had to do two things. I had to show the burden of proof of why I felt my value is not seven twelve fifty, and the rehab is why I've applied for this adjustment minimum value, and that's why I put the sixty five on mine because there's an almost identical issue with the church parking at three twenty. Okay, and so the, the, the comp. You feel my comp number one is a good comp for your subject? I don't. I don't feel that's a good comp. But can clarify, Ms. Grant. So the assessor, you're saying the the applicant's property is worth sixty eight thousand dollars less than comp one because hers is in a worse location. That right? is that is so, my adjustment. So based on what she, if if Ms. Grant's position is that comp one is just as bad as hers, you would actually have to remove the sixty eight thousand dollar reduction, resulting in. The adjusted sales price going up, and then that's that would be adjusted. I, yeah, that's so what I'm trying to understand. It's not a good position for you to say you're the same as comp one because the assessor is saying you're worse than comp one. We should remove right. value. I, I, I think there's a misunderstanding. When, when I'm noting this 68, I, I know that that's a worse location there. There's no. They're saying it's a better location. Okay, I don't agree with that. This this comp is on the corner. This, there's a parking lot that runs to the north border of 320 South F Street, which is filled. There's traffic from the church. It's the church parking lot. I don't believe that's a good comp. What I was trying to articulate, and I didn't do it well, is that I believe the 712500 that I paid for my property is affected adversely by the noise, the smoking, the meetings, the people coming and going, the cars that are at the rehab that's within feet of my property at 205 um, South F Street is the address of the rehab. Now, these, your comps notwithstanding, I'm here today to prove that point and I believe that 65000 is a fair adjustment. It proves my burden of proof that had to be at a minimum of 5%. Is that your conclusion? Yes, sir. Is that your um, Yeah, my, my conclusion is the same. I um, feel that, you know, the property was on the open market, represented by a realtor, and had a negotiated sales price, and that's what the assessment will for base year value on July 19, 2018, as well as January 1st, 2019. But that's without anybody knowing you, the realtor, myself, Without anybody knowing that the rehab was next door, now that we've all discovered that it's negatively affecting the property, when I go to resell it, I'll have to disclose that. It's going to bring the value of my property down should it hit the open market in the future. How long has that uh, rehab center been there? You know, I don't know. It's been I've been at the home almost two years, two years in July, and it's been there that long. But there's no sign out there. And the realtor didn't disclose this to you? Okay. The realtor would have no way of knowing either because, I mean, frankly, I'm better at buying and purchasing homes than a realtor. <laughs> no, no offense if you're a realtor, just because I do a lot of due diligence. They wouldn't have been able to find out that it's a rehab. I wouldn't have been able to find out unless we went door to door in the community there and knocked on each door and said, hello, are you a rehab? Hello, are you a hospital? There's just no difference in the use for that building visually it's a one-story craftsman it's enormous um, there would be no reason for me to assume that that house was a rehab it's what they call a residential rehab it's a rehab um, within a home so there was no way I could have known this and if I did I wouldn't have purchased the home Okay, I guess that uh, concludes. Uh, I'll uh, take your argument under submission. Thank and, you, uh, sir. Uh, Mr. Pacacos, I'll let you know about my decision. Thank you. Thank you, Assessor Thank you. Thank you.
So if you want to call me in a few days, I should have the decision. And oh, once I get you, around to it, it'll be mailed to you as well. Thank you. And you always are so great, so professional, <laughs> so you. helpful. Thank you. Yeah, you do. You guys want to come forward it's to the table? Yeah. yeah. We can roll it up. I just brought my. Hey, Joe, this Hello. is my um, Tracy Williams. Hi. They're my new real estate agents oh, that we're working oh, with. Okay. So we decided to do more real estate, but she's Sorry. been helping me with this, so that's who she is. Where's your chair? Mine's going to be right there. Oh. Brought my stuff. I'm nowhere in near as prepared as this last lady, but Whoa, I'm, I will take amazing. a stab at it. Yeah. Um, just because it's more of an equitable thing. So is there, what do we start off with? Yeah. So you're also challenging your purchase, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And the assessor accepted the sales price? That's great. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be the same thing. Uh, yes. You'll present your case first. You'll have the burden of proof. There's a 5% threshold. Uh, King Officer Kerr, did you want the applicant to start or did you want some background? Uh, a little more. Information about the property. Sure. Uh, again, single family residence. Uh, address is 730 Calle Contento in Thousand Oaks. Um, <clears throat> the applicant is appealing the prospective base year value appeal uh, for June 1st, 2016 transfer date and a decline in value appeal as of January 1st, 2019. Um, the subject property was purchased on June 1st, 2016 for 774500 the, uh, I'm sorry, the assessor accepted the sales price under the provisions of Rule 2, and uh, it has a total living area of 2,311 square feet. Thank you. Yep. Ready to start? Yeah, sure. Do you want me to pass out packets first? Yeah, you okay, so is this sure. everything you want to present? Yes. All right, so this one to the assessor, and I'll take the picture. Because I might have, I mean, I could have gotten some other pictures on the comps like that lady did. I didn't think yeah. to do that, but we can just discuss it. I mean, I think the issue here, you know, as I had, you know, as Joe and I had discussed at length, is the property that we purchased. First, it was an emotional purchase. We needed to be out of our current residence. My husband had a work truck. We had an HOA. We couldn't stay at our old property. So we did rush into things. It was a random real estate agent. There was no relationship. So after the fact, we were kind of kicking ourselves when we saw what the other properties had gone for. But nonetheless, it was what it was. Um, once we got into the property, I, I don't have, I don't know that my argument for the decline in value in 2019 is where I really want to hang my hat. The only reason, like I had explained to Joe, that I had an issue with that is because I thought that the purchase price in 2016 was off. And we needed to get the loan, so the appraisal, you get an appraiser, it matches up to the loan. But it's a really unique property in that there, it goes up this private driveway. The private driveway is really a shared easement between three separate parcels, or it's actually it's four lots that are on top of a hill on top of a cul-de-sac. Um, it's There's not really a maintenance agreement. I guess everybody just will kind of fix it if there's anything wrong with it. Um, so it's not private, but it does provide an element of privacy, which is nice. But there's also power lines that are obstructing the view in the front and the view on the side. So that wasn't something that I really even noticed until we got into there and started living. So it does have a view, but it's an obstructed view. Um, it's got 30,000. It's a weird property, which is why I'm giving you all this background so you have an idea of, of it in your head. It's a very strange property in that it's got 30,000 square feet um, of the non interior space, but it's all rocky hillside and sediment, and it all goes down. So it requires maintenance and fire clearance, but I can't do anything with it. I can't, um, I can't garden. I can't clear it. It's not permitted. It's all sloped. So I included some pictures in that, and I mean, Joe was appreciative of that fact when we discussed it on the phone and when he came out and did the appraisal and said, okay, I'll give you 10,000, you know, usable square feet on the outside instead of the 30, because the 30 is ridiculous. It's just dead stuff everywhere that looks pretty for maybe two months a year when there's winter grass. So it's an odd property to find a, a comp that works because we've got such a huge lot size. Um, we've got an interior that's not two story. Um, and it was all, it was, it had been built in 2007, but it wasn't necessarily like um, all modern and upgraded. I mean, it was, it was carpet, it was painted peach. I mean, we had to do a lot of things aesthetically to improve it. Um, so when we were going through the comps with our new agents, 
we came up with what's on the first page here. Well, okay, so I'll, I'll kind of explain what I did. Okay. So on the first, so I have all the property specifics here for you to look at. Um, that's just the sales price and just the property profile because since I'm presenting the case, I thought I was charged with making sure that you had those. And then the second one that says CMA report, these are the comps that Tracy and Scotty had pulled for me when we were discussing the property value. Do we move? Do we not move? And we were looking at these and, you know, again, unlike the lady that was here before, I can't tell you, you know what, my property is like this one because none of these properties are like my property. They're either two-story homes, or they've got a pool, or they've got less square footage, or they've got more square footage on the outside. So it was really hard to find something that was exactly comparable when I was going through the profile characteristics. They're all within a mile. They're all within the requisite time period that the county assessor's office required. And they all line up to a large degree in square footage and in lot size. So, you know, and I know in the blue pamphlet it says, you know, tell us what you think it is, don't just give us an average. My understanding is that in assessing fair market value, fair market value takes into consideration the entire market. So, you know, I, of course, if it's going to be, you know, if I'm going to advocate in my interest, I'm going to pick the lowest ones and say, oh, it's exactly like these, right? <laughs> but there's other properties here too. You know, but I think it's really clear from this list of comps, we paid top of market for anything that's comparable within a mile within this period of time. And when Joe and I were discussing his appraisal, which he'll present to you, um, he said something about not being able to consider properties that weren't built in the same year as ours. So ours was built in 2007. And all of these properties and these comparables were built in the 70s and 80s. And the thing is, if you flip to um, this next page here where I have the highlights, that's a line item that was prepared in the appraisal that I had when I built the property. There was nothing in 2007 that sold in that year. Everything was built in the 70s and 80s. And I guess my blooper, um, based on the last presentation, was I should have printed out pictures from Zillow or, what, or whatever of these properties that were built in the 70s and 80s so you could see. But they still have vaulted ceilings. They have the, either synthetic wood floors or real wood floors. They don't look like they haven't been upgraded since the Brady Bunch era. Like, there's been improvements. There's been... Like on literally almost all of them, they're in pr pretty much the same condition as mine. I think there were one or two where they had those nasty fluorescent lights where the bugs get trapped inside. But for the most part, it still had like tile floors. It had some carpet. It had some wood. But it didn't look like it just hadn't, nothing had been done since the year of construction. So that's why I included that page oh. and um, with the highlights. And then I guess the only other point that I have in terms of my presentation. Oh, so I have some pictures for you and it, it looks pretty right now because we've got our winter grass but just so you can see the sloping hillside and the obstruction of the view with the power lines um, but the green pictures are just the slope so that you can see as you know as I think the county's assessor's office acknowledged it's, there's dead trees and there's ground cover that grows but there's nothing I can do with it and then this fun little leak detection thing that I included here at the end was um, we couldn't have possibly known this when we got the property, but um, you know when we were out of town the second year of owning it, one of the service lines from the main leaked and it was all over. They had to call the Department of Water to shut it off. I had to repair that. It was two grand. Two grand is not five percent of the value, but it's something that sucked, so I decided to throw it in here. And then um, last but not least, I just put this in for your consideration. This is the adjacent property next door. Joe, um, you know, went to great lengths to explain to me how the valuation process works. And so one of the things that was frustrating to me has since been dispelled since my conversations with Joe. But in a matter of equitable consideration, I would ask that you also consider these facts, just in terms of what my property is valued at and this property. This property is right next door to us. It's vacant land. It's the same, it's on the same one, two, three, four that are attached to the private driveway. So that's under construction right now. That property, when it was sold, it had permitted permits, it had everything that was required for building. It was build ready, was at 233. The land was valued at 233. My land is valued at 533. Joe explained to me that, well, once a property has a structure on it and it's got the permits in place and it's set up for utilities, there's more value. So you can't just do a land by land comparison. That makes sense to me. I understand that. So, you know, I said, please come and do an inspection, whatever. But to think that my property, because there's a structure on there that I'm already getting assessed for, and because it's buildable, that it's $300,000 more in value than a property that literally sold the same month as mine, which the raw land was 233. 
that just seemed to be a really big bit of an increase because I saw the property taxes that the prior owner was paying, and then all of a sudden, because we paid this inflated purchase price, now my land is valued at 533 or something like that. So to me, that part just didn't make sense. And again, I just included it as an equitable consideration when you look at the paperwork and decide what's fair. So that's why that's there. If you're like, why does she have this lot three there? Um, and then there's pictures of the vacant land, so you kind of have an idea of what it looks like. They have an unobstructed view too, which is actually a perk, and then their but their land value is less. So the whole thing again, because of the uniqueness of the site, it's a little bit murky. It's next to impossible to find something on point. Um, you know, my realtor's here to answer any questions, and um, I mean that's really all I have. Okay. Thank you for listening. Do you have questions? Uh, I don't have. This one, uh, it looks like you have a comp that sold September 8, 2016, which based on my calculations, the latest sale you could use would be August 30th, 2016. So would taking out that September sale make a major difference in your appraisal? Um, well, no, because I didn't do an appraisal of what I thought it should be. I'm just saying market value should be something that's determined of by the market, not by any one particular property when there's so many disparities in terms of comparable aspects of the real estate. So you can delete it. I don't care. Which one was that? Uh, it doesn't have a number, so it's on page two, uh, data sale 90816. So and you can, if, if I understand this. Incorrectly, but the hearing officer wouldn't be able to consider that sale. Uh, it looks like it's 35. Oh, Bradstick Road. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure, throw it out. That's right, because you guys have the the rules about the, the time period. Right. Yeah, the time period. That, that appears did. to be the only one outside the time. Period. No, thank you. Thank you for for pointing. Again, it was so weird to even find square footage and lot size that would match our property profile. It's like. We just try to come up with anything we could. Right. It's, it's crazy. It's a crazy property. I definitely included properties that were similar. I didn't just throw everything at it. It's I, I do it all the time, and I do it for. Uh, I've sell a lot. Of, we sold a lot of property in Malibu, and I would help because appreciation, no problem. But then when the market fell, and depreciation, none of the property prices were changing, and it fell hard, as we all know. So I helped everybody uh, put it together and. And put, uh, we had a different, you could only go six months, and and I always put comps together that are comparable. I wouldn't stick just anything in there. But then when I heard you had to have it around the time you're built, I'm like, that's an older area. There's yeah. not a lot of new construction there. There's there like is nothing. upgrades, and people have we done a lot of work. We but tried to find them. That is like an interesting flag lot where they built those homes. and. Um, which was very difficult to find over there. And I was, uh, I'm like, wow. I went all the way back from 2007 to 2020 to find, I think I found eight. Everything that was in the MLS that sold, that was built within that time frame. So that was near impossible. And I, did, I couldn't even do square footage. Um, I couldn't match anything. I just went for the time frames that the, the home was built. And then the fact that it's closer to the freeway I mean, you get a lot. A lot of people are getting environmentally. I, well, the fire and all that stuff. But again, I didn't want to contest so much the 2019 because, like, when we bought it, we had no idea that we were in a mandatory the evacuation was the zone. Either, which was things. going like, and I and that was the problem. We we're like, well, where's this heading? And I think that's where we're at. Like, is there any, like I said, depreciation here for <laughs> the tips and? the trials and tribulations of uh, life in, uh, as a property owner. So we went back over everything, and that's where we were at. And then it kind of changed, and I was a little confused. But being here, like you said, today, and I'm, you, yeah. So. That's your conclusion? Yeah, that's all. Thanks. you have any questions of the applicant? Um, I'm your presentation. presentation will probably echo a lot of the same things that the applicant presented. Um, <clears throat> first, I'll run through some of the uh, legal information in the history. Uh, the subject property was purchased on June 1st, 2016 for 774500 
This value was enrolled as fair market value and established the base value for the property pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 110.1b. Uh, pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code 51a, the assessor is required to enroll the lesser of the factored base year value or its cash value as of the lien date. Uh, the factored base year value of 821904 was enrolled for January 1st, 2019. Um, pursuant to RT Section 110, the purchase price is presumed to be the full cash value of the property unless there is a preponderance of ed evidence that the property would not have sold for that purchase price in an open market transaction. It is rebuttably presumed that the purchase price is fair market value if the terms of the transaction were negotiated at arm's length between a knowledgeable buyer and seller, neither of which could take advantage of the exigencies of the other. The property was listed on the open market and the purchaser was represented by a professional realtor. Uh, the assessor presumed that the sales price was negotiated at arm's length and the sales price is the full cash value. Um, and then uh, the subject is located north of the 101 freeway and west of the 23 freeway. Uh, the subject is nearby Sunset Hills Country Club and California Lutheran University uh, in Thousand Hills. So that's the general location of the subject there. We turn to page three. This is my evaluation as of June 6, 2016. Uh, like the applicant mentioned, um, this property was built in 2009. Um, it was 2007. Oh, it says 2000. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, that's right. <clears throat> it was. I have. We have an effective year of 2009. Generally, what that Does means that is. Does that affect the value? <laughs> um, yeah. So in this case, what happened was, our office generally does. Uh, the effective year when the property started being constructed and then when the, the year bill is when it was actually completed. Um, so we, here we have an effective year of 2009, uh, but year bill of 2007, like you said. Um, and there's not a lot of properties that have sold with similar year built, like you said, uh, as well as having a similar square footage and uh, lot size. So I did have to expand my search mm -hmm. in order to find ones that I thought were comparable. Um, the subject is considered a custom built single family residence. Uh, and generally speaking, we try to compare custom built properties with other custom built properties. Um, in this case, there wasn't a lot out there for the subject. Mm -hmm. So I did rely on track properties like the uh, applicant did um, to value the property. And when I did do the site inspection and look over it, the project, uh, the subject did look pretty similar to most track properties. So, not, you know, it, it did seem to work to uh, compare it to track properties nearby. Mm -hmm. um, so what I found, um, was the first three here are track properties mm -hmm. uh, and you'll see their year built 1996 2015 2015 mm -hmm. um, these ones were the ones that I could that I thought were the most comparable um, I tried to stay as close to the year built as I could um, and these ones kind of bracketed the year built um, the square footages were similar. Uh, I did make adjustments for the differences, normal adjustments there. Uh, instead of using the total lot size, I did rely on usable lot size because like the applicant mentioned, most of the hillside is unusable. Um, so I relied strictly on the usable lot size. And that's what I compared it to on the, sub on the properties here. Um, also right below that, you'll see the view. Um, the subject does have a view, and I agree, it's, uh, it's a very obstructed view, not really a view of much, you kind of get some <laughs> hillside and canyon. You see more park, yeah, more roads. It's, it's really on one, Can you have the yeah, it's really on one side of the building, and there's really only one room that takes advantage, maybe two rooms that take advantage of the view. 
the rest of the house doesn't really have like the living room and kitchen you're not going to see much of the view at all so my adjustment for the view i did recognize it but i did use a very small adjustment to recognize it um and uh yeah and then the rest are all typical adjustments for the differences uh, if you turn to page four this is one more comp i found this was the this was the only comparable mm -hmm. custom built property that I could find around the time of the seller project. Mm -hmm. I did not put much weight in this one because it did, if you can see, it did require many adjustments because mm -hmm. really it's not that comparable. We have uh, the subject year built 2000, well, the effective year 2009, year built 2007. Uh, the, this comp has an effective year of 1980, which is a significant difference, so I did make an adjustment for that. We'll see other typical adjustments. Uh, the usable lot size, comp 4, um, has a much larger lot that is mostly usable, so I did have to make an adjustment there for that. Um, and so, like I said, I didn't put much weight in that one because I did feel it was the least comparable, but I wanted to at least get one custom built property in there to try and compare to the subject but I did more, rely more on the track properties because uh, they were closer in year built and as well the the subject property does look more like a custom built one rather than I'm sorry a track property rather than a custom built one so I felt that that was appropriate uh, if you look at my range <clears throat> I have a, a range at the low end of 780,000 uh, and my high end is 927000 The sales price falls just below my range uh, within 5%. Um, so I did feel it met, met the provisions of Rule 2, and so uh, we did accept the sales price as fair market value. So that's my... The sales uh, price, right? Are you saying the sales price when yes. you originally bought it? Okay. Yes, yes sales price. Sorry. Yeah. Um, if you go to page five, this is my appraisal as of January 1st, 2019 to determine uh, if a reduction is warranted for January 1st, 2019. Again, I looked for any custom built single family residences that might be comparable to the subject. I didn't find any for this sale date. So I did rely on um, track properties and I chose track properties with uh, year built as close to the subject as I could possibly get. <laughs> they were all built in the 1990s. I did have to expand my search out to uh, about two miles. Most of them are around two miles away, except for combo number one is 0.2 miles away. Uh, again, I made adjustments for the typical differences um, and made similar adjustments as last time in my other appraisal. Uh, that gave me a range between, let's see, the bottom of my range was 828,000 and the high was 957,999. Um, <clears throat> the factored base year value was just below the range of my comps, so I did not see a reduction warranted for January 1st, 2019, the factor base year value was 821,904. Uh, and like I said, my lowest was 828. So, in my opinion, the market value did fall above the factor base year value for January 1st, 2019. So, I didn't see a reduction in that. Uh, turning to page 8, you'll see a map of my comparables. Uh, the top there is for the June 1st, 2016 transfer, the bottom of the 2019 lean date. Um, and you'll notice they are spread apart, but that's based because of the year built uh, and the location of the subject, that was the closest concept I find that I felt were the most similar to the subject. Uh, and then the following pages, you'll see pictures of the subject. Uh, I did choose to use the listing photos just because uh, our pictures, our cameras aren't very good and they don't take great pictures. 
Uh, so I've relied on listing photos, but I did take photos when I was out on the property. They didn't look much different. They looked pretty much very similar. Just some minor changes to the SoJ property. Um, and then if you continue, you'll see pictures of my comps. I felt they were all very similar for the most part. Um, and pictures will continue all the way to page 21. So you're free to look at those. And, um, on page 23, and, yeah, 23 I have a listing on the subject property. And then from 24 on, I just have the bank appraisal that uh, the applicant provided me. Um, and uh, one one thing I did want to mention is I did I did review the applicant's comparable that she provided. Um, I believe she provided all the ones you saw today, um, and the one. The really the main issue I had was I didn't feel that properties that were built in the 1970s and 1980s were truly comparable to a property built in 2007. Uh, so for that reason, that's why I didn't consider the I didn't use the comparables that she had provided me. I wanted to make sure I got as close as I could in the year built because um, I felt that those were more truly comparable to our subject. Um, and so, in conclusion, um, the property was listed on the open market and the applicant was represented by a professional realtor. Uh, the, the assessor enrolled the negotiated purchase price as the base value for the property. Uh, the assessor believes any burden of proof has been met and requests the board sustain the enrolled value for June 1st, 2016 purchase date and the January 1st, 2019 lien date. Concludes my presentation. Questions for the assessor? Um, question slash remark is um, only that I think that it's a really significant and substantive difference that I would like you to consider that there's nothing track home about our property. There's no benefits that you get from living in a track facility. There's no um, maintenance. There's no um, you know association. There's no benefits of using a pool, a spa. Um, it looks like it on the outside. We also had it painted and all of that stuff as soon as we bought it. But on the inside, like I think the pictures will show, um, the original pictures from the listing price, there's like nothing track on me about it. So, um, but to your point, it's, it's like, okay, well, how does the house from the 70s match up? And again, I wish I had gone on Zillow, and I'd be happy to, if you want to consider additional evidence, to print out um, what these properties in my list of comps look like, because they don't look like Brady Bunch houses. They look like, they, like I said, they've got the wood floors, they've got the tile, they've got the overhead recessed lighting. So they're not all crappy, crappy houses that I'm trying to say mine is like. Um, so I think that's a significant difference that is worth consideration. And then I guess the only other question I had was, um, this is the track home. Oh, well, I already pointed out that the only reason the 2019 is of issue is because the 2016 value is off. Um, and also, you know, the appraisal, we really wanted to qualify for the loan because of the urgency of getting out of our other house. But I, I can probably provide another appraisal that shows you that the purchase price is more, a, a, um, or that the price should have been more market value, which would be an average of the comps that I sent here. You know, anything from, I think anything when we look at all of these is going to be way less than the 5% threshold. So I just think we overpaid based on emotionality and I tried to present whatever I could to, that would be helpful. Did you have any questions or anything for me or? Um, I had a remark. Oh. Um, I, I, being in Malibu, you, you got uh, Park Avenue to Park Bench. So when an appraiser comes out, oh my gosh, talk about being really hard to appraise a property. And it was it's quite similar because of the year hers was built and everything like that. But the fact that that other house is being built, I know we're going, you're talking about 2016, but that, I guess, like I said, appreciation, but that will definitely bring down, you're gonna have more, right when you come up, all that open space is gone, that house is right there. I mean, you saw it, right? Oh, the two yeah, store, the, yeah, the lot. That's gonna be a nightmare coming up and down that, because you've got how many other houses? 
Well, we've already got, we, there's four houses. There's one, two, no. There's just two other houses on the tract, and then there's the one that's going to be built now. And it's a two-story home with four or five bedrooms. He's using the entire lot I'm for not, houses. So. I'm not the construction, I'm not even, but eventually that's going to be a very interesting area that the I think would affect a buyer, yeah. for sure, for my clients. And then I would I never, I'm whenever I submit properties um, that I've given her, I'm, I know you guys are smart. I would never submit anything that was junk to you guys. I mean, I did the best I could. Like you said, it's hard. Yeah. It was like, yeah, oh my, my So my, if I could just say, my point about the, uh, the year built, mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're older, bad condition no, homes. No. What I'm saying is, um, like, e even with routine maintenance mm -hmm. and updating and that sort of thing, um, a house built in 2007 and a house built in the 70s, they're going to have different economic Absolutely. lives. Uh, you know, their 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 yeah. stakes, their plumbing, their electrical. They're going to have to need repairs and replacement long before this house will. Sometimes, live. but not in terms so of the market value, though. So that's I what, that's what I was trying to, to address everything. with the year built. No, uh, I, even I, if I understand been, that. Yeah, they can be upgraded throughout the years and look very similar. But I love um, be even I'm more. on your side. I mean, I just yeah. I um, like I said the. It looks very glamorous and sort of spa-like, but it's yeah. And then, but also the fact that uh, the service line breaks and you have to repair it. So it's like oh, well, you know. That aside, we just how you know the appreciation was, and we are. Is there anything to get some kind of monetary slow? I mean, it's it's very interesting how it, it just took a leap. And I, I know there's an algorithm that you guys must use, but. Um, the only way we got anything done in Malibu is by submitting and asking, can you please review this? And then they did. And then they, because when the market fell, no one would change their values down. And then everyone was coming to me and said, we just submitted the paperwork. And uh, they looked at it and we went to review, like you said, and we went over everything. But Malibu is, oh, nightmare trying to get the right comps. But you go further outside your area, and I, I wish I would have. I. Could have but yeah, we, that we wanted, that's the I, thing, I, I when I called the, the assessor's office too, they didn't tell me anything about year built, they just said that it had to be, it could only be within a mile, and it had to be these months for 2019, and it had to be the same month that you sold it for 2016, and it needed to be comparable in lot size and in square footage. So with those variables, like we had a hard enough time finding stuff, so then when you bring it, when you, if you're going to factor year built into it too, it's like, oh forget it, like there's just not one out there. So that's why we're just yeah, we're hoping that with, it's, you know, it's, you have all the information. what you guys can do to help. I mean, we, we don't, it's like, it's, like I said, they appreciate it. I'm like, all we can do is submit the paperwork and try to figure out where we can cap the search. I don't know at what expen exponential rate it's growing in, you know, so. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I guess so everybody's concluded. Yes. Yeah. So Thank we'll, you. Uh, I'll take that into consideration, uh, thank you. and Mr. Pavakos will let you know about my decision. Okay. Thanks thank for you. your time. Thank you. Thanks for very interesting. Okay. And you don't need anything else? Uh, I've got, <laughs> okay. got more paperwork, paperwork? than I need. <laughs> I don't know if that's yours or not. Uh, I don't know. We have two. Um, Is this someone else's? It's extra copy. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank, thank you. you. So I keep this? Keep whatever you want. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. no, well, uh, uh, sorry, ma'am, I, I didn't get your name, but you did speak on the record. Can you give me your name? Yes, Tracy Williams. T R A C Y W I L I A N S. Yes. All right, yes. thank you. I always have to keep that in the record for everyone who provided the testimony. Thank you. Okay, yes. so hearing Officer Crow, time is 11.19 a.m. if you'd like to adjourn the meeting. The meeting is closed.